next and concluding speaker for uh, track two today is David Dunn, and he's going to talk to us uh, about morphing the gateway into an Earth Mars cycle. Please help me wake, welcome David Dunn. Covering a few other things, but um, first, uh, I want to say most of my presentation was given as a future in space operations telecom that's on their website. If you just you remember that future in space operations and Google it, you can come up to it. I gave them back in uh, March 13th of this year. Uh, so, um, uh, anyway, uh, um, so what I'm going to do is give a little bit of background of, uh, of why I think the gateway came about. And I kind of apologize for it. <laughs> but um, um, the, um, uh, the first thing is um, just to lay a little back background. There are um, seven high um, orbital energy locations in the Earth, near the Earth, um, um, that provide easy, low down to be access to interplanetary space, um, so called Lagrange Lagrange. Um, libration points, which I think you've heard about in the three body problem, um, three collinear libration points, and the two triangular ones. Only five of them, of course, in the Earth Moon system, but also we have access to the Sun Earth, closest to Earth libration points. Many scientific missions have made great use of these. Um, and um, the, the first mission that really flew a halo orbit was the um, IC3 mission, and the third International Sun Earth Explorer, which uh, flew this very complicated trajectory. And the halo orbit itself wasn't complicated, but afterwards we took it out of the halo orbit, but just a very small delta V, a few meters per second, let it fall back into a looping trajectory, which then allowed us to use lunar swing bites to drastically change the orbit. Um, and all these um, trajectories are highly unstable. Uh, but they have long time scales that allow you many opportunities to make correction maneuvers and accurately navigate them. And that's exactly what we did. It was flight proven by IC3 uh, back in the early 1980s, uh, to, um, where we took this spacecraft that was originally in the halo orbit and was planned to just stay there and monitor the solar wind interaction with the Earth. Um, and then um, um, but we took it out. and and flew it to this uh, Comet Giacometti Center in 1985, about six months before the Armada. Um, and it was a um, so it was an American spacecraft. Um, uh, yeah. And I worked with, for many years, Robert Farquhar to see this trajectory and was the flight director for it. Um, so he envisioned that in the you know, early 70s, uh, right around the Apollo time, um, envision an international exploration station in a high energy vibration point orbit, with, which might be used for human exploration to Mars. Um, he realized later that uh, uh, probably better than using the Sun-Earth vibration points for the human that we're going to get into that. And, and, uh, <coughs> really a master celestial mechanician father of halo orbits and asteroid exploration. He's also flight director for the um, near Shoemaker mission in um, mm -hmm. uh, So he had some basic ideas which are given here. Um, creation of a sustainable, reusable infrastructure, which we want to do, of course, adoption of a pathways approach. Um, and this talks about how he was planning to use the vibration point orbits. He had these basic ideas in 1968. Um, and um, we'll just go on. Um, the, um, um, so our past work has all been done with impulsive burn trajectories, um, um, but um, and NASA became interested in xenon and low thrust trajectories for the ARM mission, and uh, so we started to look at SEP systems that might be used. Um, and, uh, our work used a small amplitude Earth Moon L2 vibration point halo orbit. But now, um, since people want to go to the south pole of the moon, um, they um, develop, they use this uh, nearly rectilinear halo orbit. 
substantial lunar infrastructure is developed uh, in order to uh, communicate with all parts of the moon at any time, uh, we would favor setting up just three commsats in a, uh, just like the, the Chinese did to go, uh, communicate with the backside, but if you have three of them um, in a large amplitude halo orbit, um, and then that could, with, along with the Earth, would provide continuous coverage of all the moon and its environment. And so, um, you know, one of the justifications of the uh, gateway is to provide communication to the moon, but um, it's much simpler to use commsats than to use the But um, just going on, uh, cargo missions can be, uh, more easily get to the moon using a weak stability boundary transfer. This shows the zone B is involved. Um, but, um, um, you know, Bell Bruno published these ideas. Um, we used it in effect you know, a little bit with uh, IC3, but other missions uh, have, have used it more. Um, um, and um, I'll just uh, you know, go on. It's, they, they're great for cargo missions, but not for manned missions because, or you know, uh, crewed missions because they have such long flight times. Um, so faster transfers are possible um, you know, to the lunar libration points. This shows a direct transfer at the top, but at the bottom, Farquhar came up with this idea of using a power lunar swing by, you can cut the cost in by a factor of three to get the libration point there at the expense of adding a few days, you know, but still uh, quite quickly. And, uh, and then you have this idea, if you make a mirror image of that trajectory that I showed you, the bottom, uh, you can essentially have a cycler going between the mirror and the altitude first moon L2 libration point. And so um, Farquhar envisioned having a halo, a halo orbit space station in the L2, near the L2, which he called a, a Haas then. Um, at, at that time, NASA was proposing a lunar orbit space station, something in the lunar orbit. You know, it was a follow-on to the Apollo program for lunar exploration, um, um, which uh, with LUSS was lost. Um, and um, but in the polar orbit that they proposed, low polar orbit, it would impact the moon in about four months unless they had a huge amount of station keeping delta V. And Farquhar sarcastically saying the loss would become a real loss. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, with that, uh, that prompted headquarters to change the um, thing to orbital lunar station. <laughs> but this got people thinking about halo orbit stations then, and, uh, and Farquhar with, with his strong personality managed to kind of keep that in track. And this just shows um, the um, you know, methods of, this shows the, the, an integrated trajectory then going to an L2 halo orbit and back showing the delta V's involved in the time frames. Uh, so they're essentially you know, four different ways to, to get to the halo orbit. One would be a direct transfer, the other using the powered lunar swing by which um, you know, all of them have about the same delta V out of lower its orbit. You have to get up to the moon's orbit. Um, and so that's the TTI delta V in the middle column, but the last is the post-TTI delta V. And you can see they're much different and much lower, of course, for the weak stability boundary capture uh, trajectories, but they take a lot longer. Uh, so. Um, Anyway, this shows the different halo orbits, the family of halo orbits uh, that start, uh, you know, they're sort of potato ship. This is a side view of them. Um, so Z is up in the rotating frame, and the Earth is far to the left um, along the Earth moon line. And the Earth moon L2 point is about 60,000 kilometers behind the moon. Um, so, you know, we selected a small amplitude halo orbit, which gave good visibility for certain southern latitude sites, and not the south pole, but, um, but then the, um, the um, southern near rectilinear halo orbit, the family that evolves to this larger amplitude orbit. And they actually get smaller again when they get closer to the moon, and um, there's a limiting case of about six days where it's just grazing the moon surface. Um, but uh, this has more visibility on the south pole. It allows um, 
better access to the south pole. But, um, as far as access to, to any point on the moon's surface, um, we calculated that from, from our libration point or with the small amplitude one, uh, showing very similar del Vs to get to any point. Of course, the big del V is the breaking one at the, for the landing. Uh, so, um, and, uh, and this shows a comparison doing it from NRHO versus uh, from the small halo, and you can see the costs are virtually the same. Uh, the big cost of the, the uh, service. Um, and then we also did a comparison of the delta V using this powered swing by technique, which everyone's doing now these days to get to the halo orbit and going to the small and the NRHO. Um, the delta V costs are smaller to get to the R orbit um, because they have higher delta V costs to get in and out of the halo orbit to do the transfer to the moon. So that adds uh, <coughs> about uh, 200 meters per second of delta V that you wouldn't have in the smaller halo orbit. Um, but uh, um, but the, an advantage of the NRHO is that it has a period of only six days uh, versus 14 days for, for, for the orbit we were using. Um, but then the question is, should we go to Earth Moon L2 <coughs> at all, you know, especially for um, human exploration um, or, or even build the gateway um, with the, uh, and I think uh, everyone knows uh, uh, the Zubrin's uh, mantra <laughs> here, and he gave a paper on it um, in, uh, um, in Bremen about a year ago, and that's where it really woke me up because I was thinking, oh, we should always do staging and go to halo orbits and everything else, but the big delta Vs are always at the beginning and at the end. And you can't change that. Uh, so, um, um, so anyway, he um, um, Zubrin gave these different alternatives: a the the um, NASA pathway through the um, halo orbit through the uh, NRHO, and um, and then talking about other uh, programs and ending with the you know, lunar orbit rendezvous and, and you know, finally uh, the, the direct, but the. He gives the comparison of the options and shows that they, um, the um, um, Earth Moon Direct is much better. You can see the um, total initial mass to LEO is um, only a, a fifth, a fourth or a fifth of what it is for the, using the uh, Gateway or using Lunar Orbit Rendezvous with Orion. You know, you know, if you, instead of the Gateway, you could just do um, devise a, a, a the lunar's module that would uh, rendezvous with the Orion um, at the um, at the gateway orbit, or you know, what would be the gateway orbit, or something somewhat lower. Which uh, um, and and so he's come up with these different numbers. But the uh, um, the, the direct always wins. Um, NASA looked at uh, you know his work, and they sort of did a bunch of nitpicking. Said you know. Um, that, that some of these uh, uh, things were flawed they, because the dragon mass is un, unrealistically low, and so that's somewhat true. Um, uh, there, there are some uh, problems there, but nevertheless, it's still clear that the moon drag would have a lower total initial mass to Leo, and not by maybe quite as large amount of margins. Uh, but anyway, constructing the gateway would clearly add much time and cost to. To, uh, for NASA's options. Uh, so, so Zubrin, of course, concluded, made the right conclusions, and, uh, and, and, and of course, it uh, accentuates the fact you have to do the big delta with these um, at the ends of the trajectory, and you want to take care of, um, you know, turning, take care of, use local resources at the, at the moon and Mars, and that's the key um, to further development. Brett, um, um, Bob, though, wasn't the first to criticize the station near one of the Earth Moon collinear libration points. And I was sort of surprised I saw this in Bob Farquhar's memoirs. He just gave it as a footnote without any comment. And, um, and, and I kind of don't know why. I wish I could go back and ask him. <laughs> but, uh, no, but anyway, uh, uh, he gave this quote uh, from, uh, um, you know, from Arthur C. Clarke. 
So as a station at the Earth Moon 01 point supporting lunar surface operations was discussed in a novel by Clark in 1961 in the fall of moon dust. Now, the comment of the moon-bound spacecraft stopping at the L1 station to pick up a passenger and some cargo would just waste time and a lot of delta V. <laughs> so actually the delta V waste isn't very large, but the time waste and of course the, um, the time to build the separate elements uh, is. And so um, and then, you know, it is an additional cost. But, um, so anyway, some, some of the history that you know, Bob's ideas about the Oslo back in the uh, early 70s and, um, um, and, you know, gained some traction with people, developed other things as general and association and so forth. Um, but then there was this next team around 2000, which was setting for the Space Exploration Initiative, uh, where they first used the term gateway. Um, and they proposed the Earth Moon L1 gateway, where you can't use that delta V advantage nearly as effectively. Um, but um, I'm not sure why they chose L1 instead of L2, but Farquhar kept advocating L, L2, and, and there was an international, um, the international Academy of Astronautics Cosmic Study Group, which Farquhar participated in. The, the next in the IAA studies really didn't coordinate with each other uh, very well. In fact, they were kind of competing. Um, but um, 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 but, but um, uh, some of the basic ideas were there. But of course, after, while they were doing all this in the early 2000s and 2008, NASA canceled uh, all even before SEI and, and then wanted to do ARM and go to a distant retrograde orbit. Um, then 2007, ARM was canceled. Remember, and then remembering the next and IAA studies, so they again became interested in Earth Moon L2 halo orbits. And they switched to the NRHOs at that point. Um, but um, in, um, in February, March 2008, NASA held a special meeting in, at Denver Airport about science goals for the Deep Space Gateway, um, as it was called then. And I went to that conference, and, um, and, and uh, as far as I could tell, it was just a justification sort of thing. My, my impression was there was little science that was discussed there that couldn't be performed much less expensively with the robotic missions. Yeah, but, um, anyway, during the uh, next several years, NASA and our international partners wanted to concentrate on lunar exploration. And um, uh, but I take as though if NASA insists on building the gateway no matter what, um, its aim should be changed. It, instead of just being a station uh, going around the moon and uh, supporting only uh, whatever it can support <laughs> for that, um, um, it's already planned to be moved and it already has a good propulsion system. Why not just increase that a bit so it can become the deep space transport? And that should be its primary goal. And so I don't think there's any need and we just can't afford to build both the gateway and the deep space transport. Um, but if, um, so, you know, deep space transport may be useful for human missions to Mars. Um, the migration point orbits provide a high energy perch to minimize departure and arrival delta V. Uh, but uh, you know, still, they, um, they just add different time, you know, more time to build some different infrastructure, which isn't actually needed for the you know, real purposes in, in ten. Um, but I was saying if the deep space transfer is built, it could be stored be, between missions to Mars at the Earth and altitude halo, and then um, it could be used, of course, during the early years for whatever they plan to use the gateway for. Uh, but, um, um, but with Artemis as a accelerated schedule and a reduced gateway under modules used by both of these, um, um, being considered morphing the gateway to the DST should be possible. And um, the next study actually, um, back in 2000, actually suggested building um, the um, uh, gateway to become the deep space transport. They had that idea back then. <laughs> so, but, uh, um, you know, it's uh, since then, in the vendor driven uh, situation, they uh, decided to make uh, two of them. Um, so, um, but anyway, 
anyway, if all this, if this is done, if we decide to use, do the um, gateway and the NRHO and use it as some sort of hub, um, um, we looked at you know, going from the Earth Moon L2 halo orbits to different destinations. You can do them quite cheaply. Uh, for only 432 meters per second, we can do this one-year uh, flyby mission, um, which would um, you know, fly by a near-Earth asteroid. It could be a demonstration mission before doing something more complex. Uh, so um, we could for a scientific mission, uh, but this just shows the trajectory of leaving the, you know, this is a similar rotating frame in the Earth's sun flying things, and um, showing how the uh, uh, trajectory um, can um, start from the um, moon. I should have a pointer here. We should have had a lot of laser pointer. Uh, but um, it uh, starts HD as halo orbit departure, and then this, it stays near the moon for a while, but then it goes out to the sun Earth L2 vibration point and sets up a series of three lunar swing bys. The important thing is um, just before it heads off to um, the asteroid, it goes through these high elliptical Earth orbits, HEOs, or phasing orbits there. And, um, you know, and the, the whole thing would be operated robotically until it got into those phasing orbits. And then a, a very simple space um, my, um, capsule, much less uh, needed than the Orion, uh, could rendezvous with the um, deep space transport in the phasing orbits, and then uh, the crew could transfer and go off to uh, there. This just shows the trajectory near the moon, how it leaves and arrives back at the vibration point orbit. And you can see the three close lunar swing bys there. Uh, but, uh, and this just shows the phasing orbits in more detail, uh, showing how um, the trajectories could, um, from the Earth could easily rendezvous with it. Uh, I won't go into the details here, just to point out it can be done though. And the uh, Delta V's, uh, this is for the crew transfer vehicle which would rendezvous with the deep space transport. Um, the delta V's in the third column are all pretty much the same, uh, just to get out of low Earth orbit to get into the highly to the EO, the highly elliptical Earth orbit. And then the delta V's to actually rendezvous with the deep space transport are all um, now you can throw out the dates with the highest delta V's and you can keep it under about 450 meters per second then. For several days, so you have lots of opportunities to do that rendezvous. Um, and that makes it practical then to uh, um, for such a thing. Um, this just shows a, a similar trajectory. It would actually rendezvous with this small asteroid, um, 2000 SG344. Uh, could be done with, with a halo orbit with a total delta V of under two kilometers per second. I think it's be a great opportunity for a science mission. We were suggesting it might be done as a crew mission, as a test, before you actually went on to Mars, where the Delta Vs are quite a bit higher. Um, but I give them next. I, we worked out a trajectory going to Mars, actually going to Phobos, rendezvousing with Phobos. Um, and this just shows uh, the uh, different Delta Vs. In this case, we. Um, instead of using the long looping trajectory, we just go directly into the phasing orbits with the Earth. Um, you do a, come out of the halo orbit and then take about you know, a few weeks and then do that lunar swing by with 200 meters per second, which you wouldn't need to do if you went into the big looping uh, weak stability boundary transfers um, before. But that way, um, that allows you to get into the phasing orbits where you can do the phasing orbit rendezvous and then go off to Mars. And, uh, and this just shows uh, the trajectory and this shows what you do at Mars to, to get to Phobos. Um, and the total delta V is quite high for everything, you know, about 5.6 5 kilometers per second. But you, um, this is including rendezvous with Phobos. If you didn't rendezvous with Phobos, instead you rendezvous with a preposition Mars took, you could drop this down, you could subtract 1640 from that, so it would be less than four kilometers per second you know, for the whole thing between the Earth and Mars. Uh, so um, and this just shows the return to the Earth. So essentially, this um, you capture back into the halo orbit. So this constitutes an Earth Mars cycler system, albeit it has an almost two year layover time with the Earth Moon and L2 between opportunities because it's not phased like the Aldrin cyclers, which 
you know, have exactly uh, um, uh, two two years uh, you know, between them. But this doesn't need about four kilometers per second each way for the hyperbolic line which are very time critical and high delta V, which you'd like to avoid. And, and so this, this could do that. Um, so um, anyway, we've studied some trajectories, similar trajectories using ballistic and, um, uh, and, and also hybrid missions which should take advantage of the solar electric propulsion. Um, Zuberin was uh, saying how you know, it would take 300 days to, um, to go to Mars with the SEP system. You know, now people are thinking more in terms of not using pure SEP, but using just some small um, uh, ballistic modules that would, could give you the high delta V or, or, or quick delta Vs that you need near the Earth perigees and use SEP for everything else where you have lots of time. And, um, and so that's what we were doing here to try to, um, to whoops, um, and this just shows uh, a comparison. They come out pretty much pretty similar in the, the mass, uh, um, in the mass uh, in low Earth orbit, uh, still uh, just a little bit less. Uh, um, the part of the problem was that um, we should. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of um, assumptions here about the um, sub trajectory, and in these calculations we used 150 kilowatts for the power for the array for the deep space transport. And people are thinking, I think, more in terms of 300 kilowatts, something quite a bit more powerful. And if you did that, then the SEP system would be doing more of the work and we've got uh, a bigger advantage than, than what we have here. Um, you know, there's about a, uh, you know, um, about a 5% gain on the, uh, the distance and the over the pure ballistic line. But anyway, in, um, in, in, um, this shows the, um, the overall Earth-Mars cycler, how it would work here in the halo orbit as a storage between missions. But then you go into phasing trajectories using a linear gravity assist or weak stability bounding anyway, the different transport can fast or slow, as I say there. And then, uh, and then the crew gets on just before the maneuver that ejects from the Earth, the um, uh, crew exchange, and then it uh, goes to a parapsis Mars and a delta V into a 10 day orbit at Mars. And then the Mars, uh, uh, a Mars shuttle uh, space transport. Um, we rendezvous for the crew exchange and take them to to the Mars destination, whatever it is. Um, and then talks about then. Um, in the meantime, the deep space transport remains in a high orbit, and um, which uh, we showed you could raise that orbit uh, so that the um, sun to the, towards the sun Mars vibration point, and that would allow you to reorient the um, um, apoapsis of the orbit so that it would match. The direction you need for the departure back to the Earth. And that's sort of a big key. People have to remember that uh, when you go into to a highly elliptical orbit, it has to be oriented in the direction you want to, to escape. Uh, so uh, whether it's at the Earth or Mars, you know, that would allow you the Earth. We can change it with lunar swing bodies and so forth. At Mars, we don't have a moon to do that, but you can use the weak stability boundary region uh, to do the same thing. Um, and uh, just back in August, uh, this team at uh, NASA Langley Research Center uh, developed a very clever trajectory uh, which uses a, a hybrid system, SEP, and uh, chemical propulsion. Um, and showing at the top left, they um, use, they depart the uh, NRHO, you see the orbit, the, the um, orbit um, in blue, following closely the moon, that's actually following the um, um, uh, the NRHO, but it, it slowly grows, and then you go out and do a weak stability boundary, and then a SEP maneuver. The red part of the trajectories are, are solar electric propulsion maneuvers. Come back and do a lunar swing by. Actually, it's two lunar swing bys, and it gets into a highly elliptical Earth orbit where you can do the phasing orbit rendezvous uh, just before the departure, and then um, 
and this shows the um, departure and the return from Mars. Um, but then the uh, departure there um, it uses the lunar swing by again to eject out, so you don't get the full. You, you don't have enough energy to get to, to get to Mars with the lunar swing by, but it can give you about two kilometers per second, um, um, or two kilometers C3, 2.0 C3 is what I mean, as it gives you, you can do a little bit more, but depending upon the direction efficiencies and so forth, you can always arrange things to get something around the C3 too. And then the SEP does the rest of the heavy lifting to change that from a low orbit around the Earth, or, or just going a little beyond the Earth's orbit around the Sun, to something that would actually get to Mars, and then breaking on the way of Mars again. And then it goes into Mars orbit and, and does a propulsive burn, which instead of, usually it's typically a Mars orbit insertion burn, is about a thousand kilometers per second, but using the step to slowly approach Mars, you, know, you can get that down to 150 meters per second. They propose instead of what we did is going high, they, uh, the deep space transport is lowered into an orbit, but then is they use the J2 effects of the moon to torque the orbit around to the departure direction that's needed. And then it shows the return trajectory coming back to the Earth. Um, it does a capture directly into the highly elliptical Earth orbits um, at the Earth arrival. Um, so that to lower the delta V or, or lower the speed as it comes back to the Earth here, and then uh, and then the um, uh, enough so that the um, it's less than C three of two, so that the lunar swing by can capture it uh, itself and goes into the highly elliptical orbit, which uh, then phase and orbit rendezvous you return it, or they return in a capsule directly into the ocean. Uh, but uh, the, um, the deep space transport remains in that orbit, does a lunar sw three lunar swing bys, and can get back into the uh, the, um, um, the halo orbit. It's a very interesting paper uh, that they gave, uh, and uh, over the cross quite a bit. So, but in conclusion, though, the Mars Direct is still the quickest and the simplest way to go to Mars, but there are high delta V's, quite large at both ends, um, you know, both departure from the Earth. and um, But um, the production of fuel on Mars is the answer to that, enabling refueling at Mars that's needed. That's going to be needed in the long run anyway, so let's develop it sooner rather than later. Um, but um, if you go the route I showed you, using dedicated Earth, Mars, and interplanetary vehicles, it breaks up this huge delta V virgin burden for each, uh, um, but it adds to the complexity of the system. Um, so if the gateway is built, and it's just a vacation of the week, it should be built as a deep space transport to avoid uh, building two large facilities. Um, the vibration point orbits have been great for robotic and scientific missions that are good for high energy storage locations for missions of opportunity, such as through a new long period of common. Um, uh, they could also serve as nodes for a low energy Earth human, Earth to Mars cycler system, uh, as I showed you. And it doesn't require hyperbolic rendezvous. But uh, that's, I think, better for the future. But maybe it will be sooner if the Gateway or Deep Space Transport is actually built. Uh, um, but um, anyway, the, uh, <coughs> uh, I should mention that the uh, um, Larks, uh, the Langley study, you know, showed that the deep space transport didn't need Mars refueling. It could, they could carry enough xenons, and xenon is much more efficient for putting in the delta Vs um, at the high altitudes. Just the, um, you're just doing much smaller delta Vs uh, um, uh, with the chemical propulsion, uh, so they don't need as much propellant overall. And they could carry it enough to do the whole trajectory. Anyway, um, we'll just include part of our work was funded with a Russian grant back in 2012 and 2013. And uh, anyway, the uh, my email address is there. And, um,
David Dunham at Kinetics.com and tried to make it black and kept changing back to hyperlink. <laughs> so, and um, we're going to put this presentation at <coughs> www.kinetics.com. I don't know if they're going to try to put the presentations after this conference on the website. We'd be glad to do that too. Um, but um, already you would have information using the price of and have some of the information, but not all. Not all the ideas here. So um, now I'll go a little bit over and I'll open up for questions since we I I'm uh, really intrigued by your, your final conclusion that the quickest and simplest way to remain is just Mars Mars or <laughs> Oh yeah. But uh, it, it is possible basically to serve. The gravity fields, the gravity and kinetic fields of uh, right, right, and get get certain advantages. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, you can choose you know, mail delivery, you know, next day or <laughs> next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't have to pay as much, but uh, yeah, yeah. you won't get there as fast. Right. Someone asked um, Robert Zuper, and uh, you know, he asked, well, what about Aldrin cyclers? And, and Zuberin said, "Well, um, um, let's build the um, let's build the cities first. I mean, San Francisco was built before there was a railroad, um, and, um, and, and uh, you know get the communities going. And then, if you want to get some more efficient you know transportation system that would allow more people to come or whatever, then you, you know, build the railroad. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know, the system we have is, is almost as fast as Mars Direct in terms of actually going there. Yeah. It's just that um, it's, it's a lot more complex. And, um, yes. Isn't the gateway basically uh, the goal and heights of the moon? Uh, uh, we have laser weapons now. Right, right. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think we're being subterfuge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, 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 the, it's the high perch from which you can more easily go to different places. And things. So, um, yeah. when, uh, when the Russian-French uh, balloon experiment with Venus was very successful, they went on to Haley's comment, mm -hmm. um, the U.S. gave them our deep space network to accomplish that, the time schedule was very tight. Oh, yes. Um, I'm convinced that we took their security codes at that point because Russia has never managed to put anything into Mars since. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> the devil, you say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I say. <laughs> you know, um, space has always been a uh, high on strategic territory. And it is the playground for various competing national interests. Yep, yep. I've heard that same comment made that uh, it's right, well, interesting that the Russians don't seem to be able to get anything to Mars. Have a function. We can't seem to get anything into Venus. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very fair trade. Yeah. yeah. The god of love, the god of war, there you are. Yeah. One is the toxic waste dump of the solar system, and the other is the. Uh, Next home for humanity. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, oh. yeah. It looks like if you allow yourself enough time, mm -hmm. you can basically get to Mars for nothing. At least to, uh, you know, Phobos or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could get there with less. Uh, there was a talk earlier in the presentation about the ability to have this noise to yeah, sure. um, I mean, it's still, uh, you know, I know some of that work was done, and, and NASA tried to duplicate it, and they had trouble with it. So there was some, uh, but, um, um, but, but it's, uh, it, it, it opens well, up Well, some, some of these orbits yeah. you know, have a very, very tight tolerance, and if you change algorithms, yeah, yeah, you yeah. may just miss it. Mm -hmm. 
We understand the Earth Moon dynamics pretty well. Um, if it, you can play video games just as well on your spaceship as at home. Yeah. And immigrants to America, 90% of them never got back home. Mm -hmm. So I don't see the travel time between Earth and Mars as a big deal. I mean, you get to know your fellow immigrants. Mm -hmm. you, you, you develop a relationship. That's very important by the time you get to Mars. Oh, yeah. So oh, travel absolutely. time for humans mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be, in the long run, doesn't, if we have the life support, yeah. why bother? What's your hurry? And, and, and of course, radiation protection. Yes. Yeah. Well, you turn it. You put your water between you and the sun. True. True. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't drink at all. <laughs> <laughs> you put your pee between you and the sun. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Now we're good. A little nitrogen in there slows down the gas better. <laughs> Perhaps you can answer this here, uh, and not being a rocket scientist, um, I'll, I'll ask it that uh, so if, if you've got some sort of cycler going, mm -hmm. you've got to get your and let your payload from Earth to it when it comes here, and then right. on Mars on the other end, how much delta V, how much fuel are you going to expend to get there? And okay, let's well, all done with the um, you know for going from the Earth. That's um, that's part of the phasing orbit rendezvous, you know, okay. because um, you know that's um, pretty easy. Um, you know, yeah, as we okay. saw, the delta V is uh, um, you know you have to get out of low Earth orbit for about 3.1 kilometers per second, so you do that with a big stage or something. But then, uh, you know, then the delta V's after that with the Earth vehicle is only 400 or so meters per second, you know, so it's well under what Ryan can do. Uh, so it could be done with a number of other capsules. And, uh, oh. so, uh, so, so to get to the cycle, and then in Mars you could have a similar, a similar system. I mean, they can't do arrow braking there, so there's still some pretty high delta Vs, but if the um, Mars vehicle could do those, um, then you'd only have uh, a few kilometers per second. Inter, interplanetary vehicle has to do so the cycler and the cycler can kept being reused as we are this and each say you bring a cargo then you also bring fuel to keep the cycler running yeah 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 you know I mean if uh, you know we can if, hopefully if we have um, uh, you know, if we have fuel generation at Mars then they refuel the cycler yeah. Mars, although the um, large people show you don't have to, but you'd have to bring a fair amount of xenon. I mean, they could, it's not a huge, not an impossible amount, but, uh, um, um, but uh, the, uh, since you're not doing all these long spirals and everything, but still, sure. the, uh, you know, you know. Well, thank you. Could you keep building your uh, cycler up as a hotel until finally you've got 150 people kind of camped out for three years? Oh yeah, I mean you can. Uh, I mean this thing keeps coming back if you keep building up with each um, each time you're in the phasing orbits. You can keep adding to it with these uh, fairly small um, small resources. Uh, so um, so so yeah. There's no uh, Bob Farquhar made a comment. You know he, his view was that. Um, um, lunar orbit rendezvous enabled Apollo. Yeah. He says phasing orbit rendezvous will enable Mars exploration. Oh, <laughs> now what's the um, the window to reach the cyclist? So the cyclist is coming back from Mars, right? And you're going to launch your payload to it, and you have a problem. You've got to scrub for a week or a month or something. Have you missed it? Has it gone for uh, another? No, no. Well, that's the idea of getting into the phasing orbits. So you. Do like the, the Lark study, I think is the best way to do it is to, you know, if you can decrease your delta V enough, you can use a lunar swing by to capture it. And you can do it with delta V too, just perish it in the Earth. Um, if you're coming back on a hyperbolic trajectory, you just do a new um, you know, it's usually a few hundred meters per second or something, perishing, and you'll capture it in the Earth orbit, um, maybe one, 
or maybe six weeks, depending upon the phasing of the moon that it does. And during that time, you have all these opportunities. You have um, several daily opportunities to launch the rendezvous. So, oh, OK. So, so that's, uh, that's how that would work. Sure. Cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Let's see, uh, just one last question. Mm -hmm. So with phase, you know, Farquhar said the phasing orbit rendezvous and that sort of lunar mm -hmm. phasing can give you these boosts. Yeah. And uh, he was basically saying, um, uh, what what kind of uh, delta V are, is then required to get to Mars, assuming you use these delta Vs and and you allow yourself like a three year mission, basically. Right. Right. Well, that's uh, that's what I showed. One of the things you know, that um, it's about. 5.5 kilometers per second, but you subtract, you don't, that was going to Phobos, if you subtract the Phobos part off and just go into highly Mars, elliptical Mars orbit of the Mars spacecraft, and go, the, the total delta V is somewhere around four kilometers per second, oh, then okay. to, to, to do everything from the Earth to... You know, and uh, Mars, Mars Direct is going to be like... Um, it's going to be like nine or ten kilometers okay. per second. A total mission. Right. Okay. I mean, you still have to do um, the equivalent of that and actually a little bit more total delta V. Some of it's done by the crew transfer vehicle at the Earth, and then the rest of it's done by the Mars it's transfer kind of vehicle distributed. Mars. It's, just, it's distributed, so, so you can have smaller vehicles. And, and I think that's why NASA decided to go that route, because uh, um, they just couldn't imagine it. Big enough vehicle like SpaceX isn't <laughs> sure <laughs> it could enable the Mars direct approach. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.